So let's say we have this polypeptide. We can take water molecules to hydrolyze and break some of these peptide bonds. For example, if we hydrolyzed and break this particular peptide bond, we'd be released with these two products. So how exactly do we hydrolyze and break these peptide bonds? What's the exact mechanism? Well, first, let's just focus on what's relevant. Let, let, let's ignore all this extra noise and let's just focus on what's relevant. What's the mechanism for taking a water molecule to hydrolyze and break one of these peptide bonds? Well, first, we need to deprotonate this water molecule. When we deprotonate the water molecule, we're left with hydroxide, which is a strong nucleophile. Now that we've created the strong nucleophile, it can nucleophilically attack this carbonyl carbon. When it attacks, it forms a bond. And when it forms that bond, it pushes these pi electrons up on this oxygen. And when we do that, we'd essentially form this oxygen anionic tetrahedral intermediate. And this tetrahedral intermediate is a high energy transition state. This is a high energy transition state because we have localized negative charge. This oxygen has a formal charge of negative one, so it has a lot of localized negative charge, which we know is high in energy. Localized negative charge is high in electric potential energy. So this is a high energy transition state. However, once we form this tetrahedral intermediate, then the electrons can scooch back down. When they fall back down, they reform a double bond. And when that happens, now this bond breaks and these electrons fall in the nitrogen. And when we do that, we'd essentially form this product. So we've done it. We've used the water molecule to hydrolyze and break this peptide bond. But remember, for this reaction to occur, remember we had that high energy transition state. We had this tetrahedral intermediate with that localized negative charge, that, that system with high energy. So this was a high energy transition state. So therefore, to overcome this high energy transition state, we need a lot of energy. So this reaction has a high activation energy. A lot of energy was needed to overcome this high energy transition state. And we know whenever a reaction has a high activation energy, whenever a reaction requires a lot of energy to overcome the transition state, so in a high activation energy, that reaction has a low rate constant. So if it has a low rate constant, that reaction is slow. So this reaction would be slow. And we know we can relate activation energy with rate constants using the Arrhenius equation. And I made a video on the Arrhenius equation. I have a link of it below. But the point is, for this reaction to occur, to hydrolyze that peptide bond, it, it had a high energy transition state. So therefore, this reaction had a low rate constant. So therefore, this reaction was very slow. If a reaction has a low rate constant, it's very slow. It occurs at a very slow rate. So this reaction occurred very slowly. So how can we make this reaction occur faster? How can we, how can we hydrolyze this bond and make this reaction occur faster with a higher rate constant? Well, we can use an enzyme. For example, let's say we had this enzyme. We can use this enzyme to catalyze this reaction to increase the rate constant of this reaction to make this reaction occur faster. So first we need an enzyme and enzymes are usually proteins. So let's say we have this polypeptide and I'm doing a very simple drawing of this polypeptide. So let's say this is the backbone and let's say we have these amino acid residues. For example, let's say we had a serine residue that had an R group that had hydroxyl. Let's say we had another amino acid residue that had an R group that happened to be a base. Let's say this was a phenylalanine residue with its R group that looked like this. Let's say this was some amino acid, residue, amino acid residue that had an R group that was an acid. And let's say this was another amino acid residue that had an R group that had a, a positive charge, that had a permanent positive charge. So this would be an enzyme and this would be the active side of the enzyme. So this enzyme can catalyze this reaction and make this reaction occur faster. So how does this reaction, how does this enzyme catalyze and make this reaction, this hydrolysis reaction occur faster? Well, first, what we need to do is we need to orient this polypeptide in the exact correct 3D orientation. Because if we want this peptide, this, this peptide bond to react with this enzyme, this peptide bond has to be in the exact correct location. So it can react with all these amino acid residues. So how do we place this polypeptide in the co exact correct 3D location in space so it can react with these amino acid residues? Well, normally what happens is maybe one of these amino acid residues of, of the peptide that we want to break, maybe one of these amino acid residues also had an R group with, with one of these hydrophobic R groups. So again, this hydrophobic R group can go through the hydrophobic effect with this hydrophobic R group. So when they go through the hydrophobic effect, it kind of locks this, this polypeptide in the exact correct location. So that's the first step. First step is we, is we lock this polypeptide in the correct 3D location. So now it's ready to react with, with this uh, enzyme in, in this active site. So next what we do is remember the serine residue with this hydroxyl R group. 
First, what we do is we deprotonate it. So we take this base that deprotonates this hydrogen. When it deprotonates this hydrogen, we're left with this alk oxide, which is again a strong nucleophile. So now that we form the strong nucleophile, now can nucleophilically attack this carbonyl carbon. When it nucleophilically attacks, it forms a bond. And when it forms a bond, it pushes these pi electrons up on this oxygen. When we do that, we form this oxygen anionic tetrahedral intermediate. And remember, this is localized negative charge. So, so this would be a high energy transition state, right? Well, no, this is actually a low energy transition state. Why is this low energy? Because remember, we had this positive charge amino acid residue with this permanent positive charge, which stabilizes this negative charge. So yeah, this is an oxygen anionic with that localized negative charge, but this positive charge donates some positive charge density, destroying that negative charge density. So therefore there's less localized charge. So this is stabilized. So this is a stabilized transition state. So it's a lower energy transition state. So now once we form this transition state, now what happens? Now the electrons can scooch back down, reforming that double bond. But when that happens, we can either break this bond with these electrons falling the nitrogen, or we could break this bond with these electrons falling the oxygen. So what happens if these electrons scooch back down, forming a double bond, breaking this bond with these electrons falling on this oxygen? Well, if we did that, we just go back to where we started. So we don't want to just go back to where we started. That makes no sense. So, so we don't want to do that. What we want is we want these electrons to scooch down, forming a double bond, to break this bond and having these electrons fall on that nitrogen. So how can we promote this bond from being broken? Well, we can make this guy a better leaving group. How do we make this guy a better leaving group? We protonate it. It gets protonated. It steals this hydrogen. And when it does that, it gets protonated. Now this guy is a strong leaving group. Now that's a strong leaving group. Now the electrons can scooch down, forming a double bond, breaking this bond, having these electrons fall on the nitrogen. So again, when we do that, the, we form a double bond breaking this bond, and now we've broken the peptide bond. We've broken the peptide bond. So the point is, we want to promote, we, we want to promote this bond from being broken. So we promote this bond from being broken by protonating this guy. So now it's a better leaving group. Now the electrons can scooch in on forming a double bond, breaking this bond, these electrons fall on this guy, and now we break the peptide bond. So, so we've done it. We've broken this peptide bond. So we've, so we've again gone through that same reaction. But again, the key point, the key point is that this was a low energy transition state. Remember that that tetrahedral intermediate was stabilized by that residue. Remember this, this positive charge residue. So this was a low energy transition state. So if it was a lower energy transition state, this reaction had a lower activation energy. There was less energy needed to reach that transition state. So if this reaction catalyzed by this enzyme had a lower activation energy, it would have a higher rate constant, so this reaction would occur faster. And that's the key point. That's what enzymes do. Enzymes increase the rate of the reaction. They increase the rate constant, and they make this reaction occur faster. They accelerated this reaction, accelerated this, polypep this peptide bond from being broken by, again, through, through these means. So we've done it. We've broken the peptide bond. So now what? Now, remember, this group would simply just float away. It would float away, and we're left with this. But now we have this part of the peptide covalently linked to the enzyme. So that's no good. We don't want this guy covalently linked to the enzyme. We want to we wanna bring the enzyme back to the original conditions so it can break more peptide bonds. So now what do we do? Well, now a water molecule floats around, and now what happens is this guy deprotonates the water. When it deprotonates the water, we're left with this hydroxide, which is again a strong nucleophile. So now it can nucleophilically attack this carbon, forming a bond. When we form that bond, we push these pi electrons up on the oxygen. When we do that, we had essentially formed this tetrahedron immediate, which is again stabilized by this positive charge residue. Now when we form this tetrahedron immediate, now the electrons can scooch back down, forming a double bond. But when they fall back down, forming a double bond, we can either break this bond with these electrons falling this guy, or we could break this bond with these electrons falling this guy. So when these electrons fall back down, forming a double bond, which bond do we want to break? Do we want to break this bond or this bond? Well, let's think about it. If the electrons scooch down, forming a double bond, breaking this bond with these electrons falling this guy, we would essentially go back to where we started. We would go back to where we started, which, which makes no sense. That's not what we want to do. So we know we want the electrons to fall down forming a, we want the electrons to fall down forming a double bond and breaking this bond with these electrons falling on this guy. So we want this bond to be broken. So how can we promote, how can the enzyme promote this bond from being broken? Well, we can make this guy a better leaving group. How do we make it a better leaving group? Well, it simply gets protonated. 
it gets protonated. So this, this oxygen gets protonated. Now it's a better leaving group. Now that's a better leaving group. Now the electrons can scooch back down, forming a double bond, breaking this bond, where these electrons fall on this guy, following on this leaving group. So when we do that, we'd essentially be left with this. We'd be left with this. So we've done it. We've broken the peptide bond. Now both parts can, can float away. So we've effectively broken it, hydrolyzed that peptide, broken that peptide bond. And, and now, and also notice, we're back to our original enzyme. This is the, was the original situation of the enzyme. So again, so, so now, now, now the enzyme is back to its original condition, and now new polypeptide can float around, and now we can break a new peptide bond going through the exact same mechanism. But the key point, the, the key point of this video is that, remember, with the enzyme, with this positive charge residue, we stabilize this transition state. When we stabilize the transition state, we had a lower energy transition state. So if we have a lower energy transition state, we have a lower activation energy. Less energy was required to reach this transition state. So with the enzyme, we have a lower activation energy. So therefore, we have a higher rate constant. So this reaction occurs faster. And remember, that's what enzymes do. They increase the rate of the reaction. However, when we did this reaction without the enzyme, we had a high energy transition state. We had that localized negative charge and we had nothing to stabilize that negative charge. So we had a high energy transition state. So therefore this reaction without the enzyme had a high activation energy. A lot of energy was needed to reach this transition state. And whenever we have a high activation energy, we have a low rate constant. So that's a reaction that occurs slowly. So this, this reaction hydrolyzing and breaking this peptide bond without the enzyme occurs slowly, has a low rate constant. However, with the enzyme, it has a high rate constant. The reaction occurs faster, and that's what enzymes do. Enzymes increase the rate of a reaction. They increase the rate constant of a reaction, usually by stabilizing the transition state. There are other ways enzymes can do this, but again, that's the key point of this video. But again, remember, so this was the enzyme, and this was the peptide we wanted to break. And again, these were amino acid residues. So this would represent a serine amino acid residue with its R group, a hydroxyl R group. So this would be a serine protease. This enzyme would be referred to as a serine protease because it used the serine as a nucleophile to break that peptide bond. But we can also have cysteine proteases. So cysteine proteases would have a cysteine residue with its, with its sulfur R group, this thiol R group, which again would act as a nucleophile and go through the exact same mechanism. It would be the exact same mechanism, same idea, except now the nucleophile comes from a cysteine residue. And we can also have aspar aspartate and glutamate uh, proteases. So again, we would have this R group that would either be an aspartate R group or a glutamate R group. And essentially what happens is a water molecule would float around. We would deprotonate that water molecule, creating hydroxide, which would act as the nucleophile. So again, the point is that this, these are the mechanisms of how enzymes work. This is how enzymes increase the rate of the reactions. So again, specifically, this, this, this mechanism, uh, I was inspired by the trypsin mechanism, but it's generally the same idea. It's the same steps, same idea, and, and so, so that's how enzymes work.